Welcome to today's session on the operational foundations of action-based dashboards. I am really excited to be here with you today. I am Megan Connell. I am the co-founder and CEO of Praxis Metrics. And we actually started out as a Domo client six years ago, and then we quickly transitioned into being a Domo partner. And in that time, we have worked with over 195 different brands from retail to e-commerce to service-based companies, and we have been able to help help them implement their BI initiatives. And during that time, we have learned a lot of about what does work and what doesn't work in creating action-based analytics and dashboards. So that's what we are going to talk about today. We are going to help you determine how to get the best dashboards. Now, big data is like self-care. Everyone talks about it. Nobody really knows how to do it. Everyone thinks everybody else is doing it. And so everyone claims they are doing it. So today, uh, you are in the right place if your current data situation is not what it should be, or if your dashboards make your eyes glaze over in their current state, or if you don't know how to take action from your data, or if you're nervous to go and build more metrics that don't lead to value because your current ones aren't even, or if you don't know where to start or how to plan that next phase of dashboards or even your first phase of dashboards, or if you want operational tactics rather than analytical tips. So today is going to be more conceptual. It's more about the planning, and then we'll give you some tips on what to do with your existing dashboards. So here's today's agenda. We're going to first talk about those conceptual principles on how to create action-based KPIs and dashboards. So we're gonna show you the difference between data and information, information and knowledge, information and wisdom, and really how that all relates to action-based metrics. We're also gonna show you some example of how some clients have used action-based dashboards to really grow and scale. Then we're going to transition into some operational tools and tips to leverage before you go and build any new dashboards. This includes the process of metrics mapping, the scientific method, we're throwing it back to elementary and middle school with the scientific method, but we'll teach you how to leverage that in your business today. And then we'll also go through KPI prioritization and how to create a cadence of accountability. Then finally, we'll walk into how to look at your current dashboards and improve them to be more action-based, really how to audit those existing KPIs for actionability, how to assign stewards and create that accountability with, it, with the cadence of that accountability, and then leveraging Domo and tools and features within Domo for this automaticity with this actionability. So we are going to dive into this now and we're gonna kick it off with those conceptual principles to creating action-based dashboards. Now, data in and of itself has never solved a company's problems because data is simply events and outcomes. Really, in and of itself, it's not valuable. However, when you move into understanding relationships between multiple pieces of data, it creates information. And instead of you just understanding what happened historically, you can start to gain the foundation and understanding why it happened. And then once you understand the underlying patterns and you have that knowledge, then you're able to understand what will happen. And that leads you into this state of wisdom, right? Being able to understand those underlying principles of really what levers can we pull in order to make this happen again in the future or to change these outcomes. But really all of this up to this point is completely worthless if you don't actually go and take action, right? The wise man is not wise if he doesn't use that wisdom for action. Um, and actually Aristotle talked about how there's three main constructs of man. Number one is teoria, which is simply thinking. Then there is poiesis, which is making. And then there is praxis, which is the practical application of wisdom to positively impact results. It's the action, it's the doing. So when we take a step back and we look at this from the framework of our data, dashboards, and BI, you know, there's a lot of thinking that goes into this a lot of times. There's a lot of planning in place, and then there's really a lot of time spent and effort and energy and emotion in the making. But then how much of our time is actually spent then in the action 
tied to each of these KPIs. And that's what we're spending today's time on is really that action. So let's take this, and, and this is a very simplistic elementary example, but it's really to show you the value of this and how we can actually leverage your data to create those positive results that we're looking for. So let's think about this in the form of rain. So a piece of data would be, it is raining. But information is understanding the relationship between the temperature dropping 15% and then it's starting to rain. And knowledge is understanding that when humidity is high and temperature drops, then the atmosphere is often not able to hold all of the moisture and so then it rains. But then there's a line in the sand right here. And if you think about this data, information, and knowledge, that's all an evaluation of past information, right? But then right here, when you step into wisdom, it's really being able to have some semblance into the future, what is going to happen? Because when you have a full understanding of how all of these interactions work out between evapor evaporation, temperature changes, air currents, then really that's when you're able to then predict rain next week. Now, the weatherman gets so much crap from everybody because it's very difficult to predict the future without all of this historical data, but it's a very difficult thing to do. And that's why, you know, a lot of companies, when we're looking at this, when they're using their dashboards and data, a lot of times it's just a reflection of what has happened in the, in the past, and they haven't necessarily stepped into that predictive analytics or using it to step into really even action. And action in this example would be something that would benefit you, right? You're taking the time to pack an umbrella and boots for your vacation next week to stay dry, right? So all of this is completely worthless if it just lives in your head and if it's something that you know or understand, but we really need to use this data to create benefit in our lives, in our business, and in, in the positions um, within our organization. Taking action from data is the new competitive advantage. You know, 10 years ago, people or companies that had access to data, they had the competitive advantage, but that's no longer the case. Data is overflowing. There's almost too much data nowadays. And so, you know, even small to mid-sized businesses have access to a plethora of information that's public data or their own internal data from all of their systems and, and technologies. And so now when data is everywhere, it doesn't matter how much data you have, it's really how are you taking action from this? What are you doing to create different results and benefit your organization based on this data? It is the one thing that we are seeing separate business from business, right? If you all have access to the same information, it's what you do with it that creates the difference. So one question that we like to ask is, what if your business was one data-driven action or decision away from exponential growth? And we've seen this happen time and time again, where companies come in and they'll go and build a hundred different metrics and then do nothing with it and it just sits there. And then we've seen different organizations create one KPI and then they have this exponential growth. So let's give you a couple examples of some actual client stories and how they've created one, one KPI that created exponential ex, uh, results. So our first example is Earth Echo Foods. They are an e-commerce brand and they promote multiple funnels on multiple different advertising platforms. And they had a specific funnel that was converting really well to cold traffic on all other channels, but not working on Facebook for some reason. So they wanted to create an action-based KPI that would lead them to understand if they should cut that funnel or if they should keep that funnel on Facebook. So they decided to build a dashboard and to reverse engineer these, this you know, action back to what are the variables that impact it. And the number one thing that they saw that would impact whether or not they would cut this funnel or not was the customer's lifetime value based on the originating source funnel. So what we were able to do is they, and granted they already had lifetime value as an average across all of their different channels, but they needed to have that cohorted out based on the different sources so that they could be more specific to understand what action they should take on each funnel. So as we dug into this, their data and created these different Domo dashboards to let them know every single source and what, how, what it was yielding in terms of customer lifetime value, they were able to find out that their average customer lifetime value was $50 across all of their channels. And yet, 
the ones that were converting on Facebook not only would purchase initially, but they would come back over and over and over and over again over the course of the next one to two years. And so even though it wasn't converting from a very small window perspective on the Facebook algorithms, it was actually yielding clients that were worth a lot more. So just by understanding that specific cohort and that specific action-based KPI, they were able to, ter to determine not only should they not cut that funnel from Facebook, they could actually increase their allowable cost per acquisition per customer because those customers were worth so much more. So the action that they took was number one, they did not cut the funnel. Number two, they increased their CPA by $5. And that simple change of $5 of, of an increase on that channel increased their average sales per day from 15 sales a day to 315 sales. And that didn't take them a year to you know, reap these benefits. As soon as they made this change, they hit that 315 within a month of that change. Within two months, they were actually going up to 615 sales a day and it continued from there. And not only did it increase their actual number of customers, it increased their revenue and their profitability because these customers were worth so much more over time and they only had to pay that allowable cost per acquisition once. So it increased their profit, but the, it also increased their revenue of this funnel from 2 million in annual revenue to 19 million. It increased drastically. So this goes to show you that an action-based KPI can result in exponential results. Another example in a totally different industry, we have a client that, uh, that had raw goods and they turned it into yogurt and then they would sell it solely on the retail channel. And what they had done is they'd created annual contracts with all of their vendors and those annual contracts specified that they would send a certain amount of yogurt every single month to this vendor. They had consistent production costs, consistent shipping, they had consistency across the board every year. But after one quarter, they realized that they had thrown out $40 million in yogurt and they couldn't figure out why. And so what they did is they, they went back and they looked at how, how they initially made their decision on these contracts was based on annual averages. And what we've proven to them is that averages are inherently evil. It takes the highs and the lows and the mashes and all together. And what they determined, what we were able to find was that there was seasonality trends that happened with yogurt. And once you think about it, it really does make sense. You know, in summer, milk is a bad choice. You don't want really cold milk on a some hot summer day it just isn't that appealing and then in winter when it's cold outside you don't necessarily want cold yogurt as well and so there is a peak opportunity of yogurt consumption and that's in spring and fall and so they were able to use this data mashed up with the you know the sales data versus temperature data and they were able to make these correlations of consumption of their of their yogurt and they were able to go and rewrite their contracts with their vendors. So again, this, all of this knowledge, all of this information, all this wisdom, knowing these correlations does nothing unless you go and take action to change this, to change your results. So they went back to all of their vendors. They rewrote those contracts to allow them to have variable deliveries and variable yogurt uh, quantities that they were sending. And they were able to then optimize and reduce their waste. They were able to optimize their sales and reduce their waste. Another example of a customer that used temperature data to create action in their organization is a service-based organization. They deal with pest control all across the country. And what they realized is that they had two different aspects of their company that were really negative. Number one was their return on ad spend. They were spending a lot online to get customers to reach out to them. And number two was the actual hard labor. They were hiring people all across the country that had consistent salaries and and they were on call all the time, but they weren't actually getting calls. So what they were able to do is merge the temperature data with not only their marketing data, but also their services data. And they were able to realize that at certain temperatures, different rodents become more active or less active. So they were able to hyper target their ads to specific areas that had a temperature increase or decrease within that 72 uh, degree range. And they were able to increase their return on ad spend by 312%. And not only were they able to increase their return on ad spend by that much, they were also able to reduce their actual hard labor costs by not employing people where there was such variability in the temperatures and then having those people only be paid when they were 
were on call or got the actual calls. So that yielded a huge benefit for them. But then even Praxis, we're a service-based agency and we're, we are practitioners of what we preach. We had a lot of dashboards, but we weren't taking action from them. And so one year at the end of the year, um, we decided to go back through all of our dashboards and make sure that we actually tied each of these KPIs to action. So one of the KPIs that we were monitoring was how many billable versus non-billable hours we were actually giving to our clients. And we had that on a per project basis but we weren't doing anything with it. And one year we decided to create some standard operating procedures, some alerts within the, in the dashboards, and then some thresholds for our team members. And we started to train them on, here are the standard um, measures of success. If we have a client who pays for 100 hours worth of services, and we say that we're gonna deliver X, Y, and Z, and then they ask for something else, in the past, we just really care about our client's success. And so we would say, for sure, we'll definitely do that for you. That's a fun thing for us to go and create because we're data nerds, right? And so we would do those extra 20, 30 hours just to have that awesome deliverable and have a high five and you know, it's a win-win. Um, but over time, what that did is that stopped us from being able to be profitable because it was, we were paying out all of these expenses to our team members, but then we were never in, we were never getting the revenue for that. So what we did is we actually took that number and we said, okay, so if a client pays us a hundred hours at 90 hours, we notify the client if there's any extra deliverables that they wanted us to do. And we would send them an estimate for how much that would be over the initial scope. And just by implementing these thresholds, these alerts, and these internal standard operating procedures based on the data that we already had in dashboards, we were able to increase our revenue by 400% year over year, and we were able to increase our profitability by 31%. Now this, again, it wasn't a huge, like long-term change. This happened within three months. It was December that we analyzed the data and realized we weren't taking action from it. And by March, we had gone from 3% profitability to 34% profitability. So this is something that even with the dashboards that you already have in place, it is so important to audit them and say, yes, we know this, but what are we doing about this? And that's what we're here to talk about today is that by one metric, you could really change your business. So now we get into the next phase of this, which is the four operational processes that you can leverage before you go and build any new dashboards. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna only focus on the wildly important, because as you all probably know, there's a lot of could do's, but not necessarily a lot of should do's, especially when we're trying to focus on action-based KPIs. There's only so much bandwidth that your team has, and so bombarding them with 137 different metrics for them to go and look at, and they're nice to knows, uh, we'd rather have them focus on those need to knows and the things that will actually create action within their day to day. So the first thing that we're going to do in order to help us focus on these wildly important things is go through the process of metrics mapping in order to correlate the KPIs that you're building actually back up to your business objectives. So I'll go through this in depth in just a minute. And then we're going to go through the scientific method. And this is really to tie these individual KPIs to the action that they're going to take and the hypotheses that we're forming around these. And then we go into KPI prioritization because again, you don't need to build out everything you think you should. You really need to focus on those top ones. And then we're also going to talk about how you can create a cadence of accountability to make sure that the actions that you determined your team should be taking are actually being taken, right? And that is what guarantees action and a return on investment on all of these dashboards that you're building. So let's dive into metrics mapping. So going backwards to the Pareto's principle, it is a principle that talks about how 80% of your results are caused by 20% of your actions. And it's the same thing with the dashboards that you're about to build. You do not necessarily need to go and build 100 different KPIs when 20 of them could create the outcomes that you are looking for. And so we're going to teach you how to use metrics mapping in order to narrow this down to your, those top 20% and to make sure that these KPIs are tied to your organizational goals and objectives. Now, what most people do is they start off by asking a question and then they go and build a KPI for that, right? So they ask this business question and then they tie it to a KPI. But the first thing that you need to do before going and building any dashboards 
is first identify what are your business goals? What are the objectives? What are the intentions? And what are the outcomes that you're looking for within your organization or within your division of the company, right? And most organizations will have some sort of set expectations on this quarter or this year. So taking those and then reverse engineering those into the, the business questions of how can I accomplish this objective? Or what do I need to know in order to hit this goal? And then you can go and tie it into individual KPIs and metrics, right? So we don't want to start from the middle down. We want to start at this high level because what all too often happens is people ask all sorts of questions, but they don't actually yield any sort of benefit to or move us closer to our goals and our targets. And then obviously, once you have all of these metrics listed out, then you can reverse engineer them into the, you know, the text sources, into, you know, what columns and fields they are, and then define the formulas and filters, and then go through and map out the visualization. The top three things, the reason that this is a different color is because this is typically the operational team. This is what they need to decide. The tech team can go and do all of these things in green, but these things all need to be decided by the operational team because you are the ones that will be taking action from this. And there's a million questions that can be answered from the data up. But if you start with the top level down, it will really help you to stay focused and clear and organized and not over create. So that's tip number one. The next tip that we're going through or the next you know tool and tactic that you can use is the scientific method. Now. This should be familiar to most of you, but you probably forgot it when you were 13 because you'd passed the test and then moved on. Um, The scientific method is actually something that is tried and true, and it's used for very important things in science and research, but then we don't use it in our business. And it's something that is overlooked and it's something that can be exponentially valuable for you if you start to recall this and start utilizing it. Now, you don't have to do it as you know scientifically as most scientists do, but even just using this as a framework moving forward will help a ton. And this also aligns with the metrics mapping and kind of correlates. So I'll show you that in the next slide. But the foundation of this is, just like before, observing data and defining questions. So looking back at, you know, metrics mapping, you're typically business goals are set by looking at historical data and then setting future projections for that. And so that's the first step of scientific method as well is going back, it's observing your current results and your data, and then defining those questions that need to be answered and identifying any sort of problems that need to be solved or goal outcomes. Then we move into the next phase. And this is where as a business opportunity. We really skip this and it's so, so, so valuable. Then we go into research and forming hypothesis. Now, a lot of times we do the research part in business. We'll go and we'll gather the data. We'll go and aggregate it together. But then a lot of times we don't actually think about, well, what do I expect to see? What are the results that I think we should see, right? So for example, going back to that use case with um, Earth Echo Foods and Danette May, they had a expectation. Their hypothesis was that those Facebook clients who came in and purchased, that they were worth an average of $50 each. And without having that baseline, they can't go and you know plan for the future. And they can't even, when they get the data, they can't even understand if that data is accurate or not because they don't have a baseline of what, the, what they expect. So forming a hypothesis is extremely critical to all of the future res- the results and the success of building out these KPIs because you have to have that baseline. Then let's say that you get the data, you get the research. All of this comes together in the form of a dashboard. What a lot of people do is then they skip over to analyzing the data and interpreting the results, which in the first phase is important, right? You'll go through, you'll get data, you'll interpret results, but then it gives you new data as you go and experiment and take action. And this is that whole you know, practical application of knowledge piece. This is where you need to go and test your hypotheses, go and test variables and document everything along the way. A lot of times we don't do the, this stage and we just go from research to analyzing and interpreting. And then we just kind of observe and we don't go and document all of the changes that we're making within the organization and then seeing what that change yielded. A lot of times we just look back and say, hey, look, from October to November, we increased our average customer value by 30%. And then we say, well, why? What 
yielded that. And so we're actually looking at it from hindsight rather than saying, hey, look, here's our current state. We're going to go test X, Y, and Z. And then we expect to get these results so that when it increases in October, we actually know what caused that, right? A lot of times we end up going backwards and trying to search for these things that we were testing versus documenting it up front and then having that as insight to then have more context to properly analyze and interpret the results because you have the full picture of what was tested. So then once we're here, we obviously collect and analyze the results. We form our conclusions as to what caused these outcomes, whether it was good or bad, because we have all of the variables and inputs that changed it and created these outputs. And then we determine statistical relevance and then accept or reject our hypothesis. So going back to that example with the client is, you know, their hypothesis was if they cut their spend on Facebook, they would be able to increase their spend elsewhere and they would have better results. Once we went through and experimented with the data, we were able to see that there was actually a completely different uh, path that we were going to reject their hypothesis because we found that the customer lifetime value was actually much higher than they assumed. And then we were able to share that, democratize that with our other researchers and scientists, our other coworkers and departments, and then go through and say, okay, so now that we know that customers are worth $100 on this, we're gonna go and test. We're gonna go through and we're going to create another action. And then we're going to get new data from that, right? We're going to increase our allowable cost per acquisition by $5. And then we're going to go and test and make sure that our, that our customer lifetime value yielded $100 per customer. And then we're going to go through and we're going to rinse and repeat, right? Where Domo can step in is in each one of these steps. But what we're lacking operationally is a lot of this documentation and experimentation and then taking action on this, right? We're leveraging Domo for all of the other pieces, but not that one. Now, this visualization is the exact same thing. It's still the scientific method. It's just laid out in a different format that might be a little bit more um, realistic to you guys in your dashboarding process. So let's walk through this a little bit. On the left, we have identifying needs, metrics mapping, reviewing and prioritizing KPIs, and that all is part of the planning stage, which aligns with this observing the data and researching and forming these hypotheses, right? Then we hypothesize, we assign stewards and accountability, which is, again, you know, who's going to experiment, who's going to take that action. And then we go through and we'll, we'll build, right? We'll build these new KPIs, we'll review and we'll validate those. And that is, you know, how we are able to analyze and interpret our, our results. And then same thing, as, as we're going through that, we'll explore, we'll test, we'll get feedback, we'll get new ideas, and we'll iterate and optimize these dashboards. And that kind of signifies this loop here, right? So whatever way you want to adopt this internally, it doesn't really matter as long as you have those different pieces and you know that you're going to need to be doing all of these stages in order to really get KPIs that are actionable and that really make impact in your organization. So next we're gonna go into KPI prioritization. Now this is really important to do because again, going back to Pareto's principle, you're only gonna have 20% of your KPIs that are gonna yield 80% of your results. So it makes sense to start with those instead of leaving those for the end and for the last things that you go in and automate and visualize within Domo. So this is a very simple tool to use and it's simply a matrix to go and list out your KPIs that you have mapped out whether it's in metrics mapping or in any other sort of format and then go through and say okay so how much value and how much impact will this KPI have on our business right if we were to have the answer to this and somebody were to take action on this what is the potential good outcomes of it right and if it's a nice to know if it's something that it's just like oh well I mean it's helpful just to have it in the back of our minds, but it's not going to actually yield somebody going and doing something, then it would be a low value KPI versus a high value is somebody is actually going to base their job around the results of this and it gives them feedback as to what to go and do next. And then we have the actionability, right? So we've got business impact and we've got actionability. And you can go through on this quadrant and obviously the priority one KPIs are ones that are going to have a high actionability as well as ones that have high value. And those are the ones that you should start with in the, in the building, automating, and visualizing within Domo. And then once that's completed, then you can move over to these ones that are maybe less actionable, but they're still extremely valuable for you all to know and to have insights into. 
But then we have these ones down here that are actionable, but they're not really valuable, right? These are ones that end up becoming a big time suck for your team, but not a huge value for your organization. So again, imagine that you created 30 metrics here it would create a huge resource suck, but then it wouldn't create a lot of value. And this is where a lot of our clients get stuck. And this is where people get frustrated. If you feel like you've created a lot of dashboards and your team is doing a lot of busy work, but you're not seeing the benefit, it means that you've probably prioritized these KPIs instead of these ones. So it's, it's really important to kind of note what you've done in the past to create the results that you have currently achieved and then to change that in the future. Again, take action from your current data. And then these ones are what we call vanity metrics, where they're kind of low actionability, low value. We also tend to sometimes say that these can be uh, vanity metrics because they're ones that you don't take a lot of action on, but they are nice to see. So these ones you definitely don't need to spend any time visualizing at all um, versus these ones because they do have some value. We would recommend working towards those. So. The last piece of this in order to plan properly for dashboards that have not yet been created or that are on the, on the horizon to be created is creating a cadence of accountability. Now, again, this is operational. So when we're thinking about your Domo dashboards, we really want them to create a compelling scoreboard. And when we think about scoreboards, you know, people play differently when you're keeping score. It's always that way. Even in elementary school, kids, kids play differently when you're keeping score. And the scoreboard really allows you to know if you are losing or if you're winning instantly. But the only way that they do that is by allowing you to know what the, what the score is, right? Um, the highest level of performance comes when people are engaged and the highest level of engagement or action comes from each player actually knowing their score and how they score. What are their expectations and how is it that you that they can actually win? Now, this is true at, from an organizational perspective, but also on an individual level. So if you have team members that are not as engaged, this is how you get them engaged. If you have team members that are, you know, doing a lot of busy work, but they're not actually creating that momentum that you need them to, this is how you create that change is by creating a scorecard card and really allowing them to know what are those thresholds and measurements of success. So let's dive into this a little bit deeper. So when it comes to accountability, you are defining a steward for each KPI. And this slide, I would say if you could screenshot anything from this whole thing, and obviously you'll be able to come back to this, but this one I would say is the number one thing that we have seen all of our clients not do. And once they do it, it creates a huge shift in the actionability of their data. So number one is that every single KPI, it does not matter how many KPIs you have, you need to have a steward who is in charge of each one. And it could be 20 marketing metrics are all under this one marketing manager, or it could be, hey, this one person is responsible for these three KPIs and that's it, right? But every single one has to be assigned to somebody. And then you also need to define how frequently each KPI should be monitored. What we've seen is, you know, over time, you're going to get more and more and more KPIs and it doesn't get easier to manage these dashboards and make sure that they're being used. And so as you're going through and creating this framework for what you're going to create, you need to know how often people should be checking these things. And it needs to be defined very clearly, not only within the KPI itself, but also to the person who's going to be monitoring this. Then you need to define the hypothesis. The person who's monitoring this might not have the historical information or knowledge that you do as their manager, as their director, as their VP. And so creating that standard and letting them know what historical data you have to form this hypothesis is extremely important. Then also allowing them to know what is the ideal outcome. So here's what we think it will be. Hey, we think that our customer is worth $50, but man, we really want to get it to $70 within the next year and creating those goals and targets for each KPI and clearly defining them. Now, the problem that we see with a lot of our clients is they have it in their head, but it's not written down. And so it's not clearly communicated. And then also creating a rhythm of regular, frequent and short meetings for accountability. Now the short is in there for, uh, for a reason. Um, and these have to be scheduled on the calendar. So. Another way to say this is trust, but verify. 
we have seen that a lot of times you will build out a dashboard and, and hand it off to somebody and then say, you have all of the tools that you need in order to do this well. And then you step back and then things get forgotten. Things get misinterpreted. Things get, you know, low on the totem pole and then they, and then actions don't come from these dashboards. And we've seen this happen all over the board and it's because there's no sort of accountability in terms of meetings. So if you have somebody who's in charge of five KPIs, you are telling them how often they're going to be monitoring these KPIs. You're going to tell them what their goals and outcomes are. And then you're going to create this cadence of, hey, you're going to check this every single day, but I, you're going to report to me on a weekly basis how this is looking. So I don't have to go into the dashboard. I don't have to go and, and manage all of these different KPIs. But now I'm double checking that this is happening across the board with our organization. So these short meetings and they have to be short because you can get really caught up in paralysis by analysis especially if you're sitting from a management perspective but this is important to create that that verification that things are being done and that they are being monitored and that people aren't forgetting different kpis a lot of times over time people say oh yeah I've, i monitor that thing all the time and then they start monitoring it less and less and less and less because it's in their head that they already know this so they don't have to check in on it. So this cadence creates that accountability to make sure that things don't fall through the cracks. And this kind of ties back to this hypothesis and outcomes. It's documenting all of these things in your Domo dashboard, okay? so. A lot of our clients have multiple tools where they'll have maybe a project management tool or you know they create a lot of Word docs or Google docs or they create SOPs in standard operating procedures in a specific form in a specific program somewhere. The problem is if you are in the Domo dashboard and you don't have that other thing pulled up, a lot of times it's not top of mind. And so what we recommend, Domo has the fantastic functionality to create note cards, descriptions, PDFs, and videos within the dashboard itself. And I'll show you some examples of how to loop this in so that as people are using the dashboards, they're not having to go and find something else. They're not having to go and look for something else to gain context or insight as to what they should do next. It's already within the Domo dashboard. So you document that all so that it's super, super clear and it's really easy and accessible. And then you can hold people accountable for producing the predicted results and the desired outcomes based on the actions that they've taken from these dashboards. So now I wanna show you how you can actually do that within Domo. There's so many features in here that allow you to create that ease and effortlessness with your dashboard so that people aren't having to go to multiple places. So here's our client, Dunder Mifflin, and you can see that obviously you can have those single value metrics and all of the KPIs, but you can also create these widgets off to the side and these note cards that allow you to tell your people what questions to ask of this data. You can create reminders around you know, context. You can create the, the instructions and you could even link to videos that allow them to have all of the tools and tips at their disposal without them having to go and find this elsewhere. And that allows these dashboards to be much more usable because as you increase the amount of tools that they have to go and search for, it decreases the, the efficacy and the, the rate at which it will actually happen. And so we want to make sure that we're minimizing um, any excuses for people to not be able to take action within these dashboards. And by adding these things in, it definitely decreases that. So going back to the cadence of accountability, the way that this would look, and you can put it in whatever format you would like, but really, again, this is all set up to trust but verify. So let's say that you have your organization and you have your different departments and then each department maybe has a manager and then individual people that have different roles and uh, responsibilities within the organization, each, of, each one of those people should, should be aware of the organizational goals. What are, what are the quotas that we're trying to hit? What are the different um, metrics and the targets that we are being held accountable to at a company level? And then we can put individuals assigned to those individual uh, goals and turn those into metrics that help support that. And within Domo, you can leverage you know, alerts. 
you can leverage buzz comments to allow the individual to ad hoc and reactionarily you know, respond to things that change within the system. But then you also have that individual steward responsible for individual KPIs. And within Domo, you also have the ability to turn alerts into actual tasks and reminders for this person to come back and to complete uh, different cadences. And you can set that up to be a daily responsibility. And then the manager, would then meet with that person weekly in a one-on-one -on -one, and we schedule these every single week between the manager and the team members in a 15 to 30 minute call to have that person go through and say here are the kpis that i was responsible for here was the goals here are the outcomes that we were targeting and here's the changes that we have seen here's the hypotheses here's the actions that were taken here's the results that we expected versus the results that we achieved right and so it doesn't need to be the manager's position to go into every single kpi into every task, but we're making sure that each of these KPIs is having that movement um, and those deliverables and the action taken. And then at an operational level or at a team level, you can also have monthly meetings. Um, so we've got clients that do this on a monthly basis. We have some that do it on a weekly basis and we have some that do it on a daily basis. But if they're doing it on a daily basis, the KPIs that they're monitoring become much more high level at the organizational level or the team level rather than individual peoples right then obviously at the organization level there will be those quarterly meetings where all of these individual kpis all of these objectives all roll up into that meeting and um, so that but all of that is reverse engineered down into these kpis as well so you can set this up in whatever hierarchy or cadence you would like but this is what we're looking for is a cadence of accountability of who is doing what and then as they're doing that, who is validating that that is actually happening? Who is the one responsible for saying, did this action actually happen? And it could be as simple as just managing by exception, right? When alerts are set up and alerts are used properly within Domo, you don't necessarily have to monitor every single thing. You can go through and you can see the things that have changed drastically or the things that haven't changed drastically. So hopefully that helps you give you a foundation as to what to do before you go and build out any new dashboards. These four principles will help you make sure that you're not wasting your resources, not wasting time, not wasting energy in building something that's not going to create action and actually have people do the things that you expect them to do. So now we're going to go into the steps to improve your current dashboards to be more action-based because most of you here are not starting from scratch. There's probably a lot of things that have already been created and as you're going through this, you're sweating a little bit because you're like, oh my gosh, we have not gone through and made sure that all of our actions or all of our KPIs have actions tied to them and that's okay. There's a very simple process that you can go through to just audit your existing dashboards to start getting them to be more action-based. Now, obviously, as you create new stuff, you have that framework now, and the framework really translates pretty clearly into what you can do with your existing dashboards. So the first thing that you do is you audit these KPIs for actionability, right? And it's simply going through and saying, okay, are these vanity metrics? Are What action is being taken from these? And a good question to ask is, is this a leading indicator or a lagging indicator? Is this something that we take action off of or is it something that, that provides us insights as to did something work or not, right? So for example, with sales, the total revenue generated is a lagging indicator. It is the result based off of multiple variables of effort, but it's not something that is directly controllable. If I say that today we have a revenue of you know $500,000, that's nice to know, but I can't take specific action off of that. A leading indicator in the sales world would be something like, how many cold calls did my team make today? Or out of all of my you know, opportunities, where is my salesperson's time going, right? Where, how many calls did they make towards opportunities that are ready to close? And so there's leading indicators versus lagging indicators. Lagging indicators will most likely be the ones that will not be tied to action. Um, and you can separate those out. That's not saying that there is not a place for lagging indicators because it is a literally a culmination of all of the different actions that you're taking and it's showing the results. So it's still important to have those at an organizational level, but it's not going to be on an individual's KPIs list, right? So you will not have a salesperson who just has access to the total revenue in the organization because it's not something that they are specifically responsible for. 
And so you need to find the things that are controllables, the things that an individual can go and take an action off of. And then that's what creates these individual dashboard KPIs. So you can ask the question of, hey, if this were to change 50% tomorrow, what would we do? If it increased by 50%, is there an action that somebody would take? If it decreased by 50%, is there an action somebody would take? And you'd better believe that, you know, if the revenue decreased by 50%, there'd be, there'd be actions taken, right? What you can do is if something is actionable, then what you need to go and do is document this out and say, okay, so if it were to change by X percent, who do we expect to take action on this? And then write it down within the Domo dashboard, right? And then you can create the, this in the description of each individual metric, or you can create instructions like we showed in that last dashboard, or you can create reminders within the dashboard text or within the um, alerts module in order to help the stewards of these KPIs remember what those actions are for each KPI. Now, this doesn't need to take a ton of time. It can literally just be a manager and an individual going through the dashboard and saying, okay, so on this KPI, you know, let's say it's lifetime value. If this goes up to 70%, what would be the next question that you're asking, right? And what would be the thing that you do in order to see, you know, what caused this? And then you could create another metric that's more actionable rather than the initial one, right? And as a bonus, this also makes it easier to transfer ownership of KPIs because these action steps, the, the, the expectations of that role are documented within the dashboard. So if one person needs to change roles within the organization or if they leave the organization, you're no longer having to transfer all of this knowledge that's in somebody's head. It's already within the dashboard. It's already set up within the alerts. And all you have to do is change that person over and everything is documented so they don't have to think, they just have to do. And that's really the purpose of this is to create the action and to reduce the person's time from thinking and figuring things out to just saying, oh, that happened, here's what we need to go create. Now, the next step is assigning those stewards and creating accountability. Again, this is with existing dashboards. So just go through the dashboard and say, on each individual KPI, Who's in charge of this? And that's really the number one question you need to ask. And then number two is, do they know that this card exists? I've seen it so many times where organizations have changed individuals to different roles, and then the new person coming in just did not realize that these dashboards were part of their responsibility, and then they never monitored them. So it's really important to do this, to audit this, not just once, but audit it often. Maybe every quarter go through your dashboards and audit them for actionability. So who's in charge of this? Do they know the card exists? And who is going to hold them responsible for this KPI's success? So if the, you know, if the operations person is in charge of reducing overhead costs, who is going to audit that to make sure that that's actually happening? The actions here are defining a cadence of meetings, defining who the attendees are, and then creating an actual agenda um, with what are these KPI expect expectations. And then just going through and creating calendar invites with links to this agenda that are already set up on repeat, right? Ones that say, hey, if you're gonna meet with your client, with your team member every week, setting it up to, so that every Wednesday you're having that meeting and then within the calendar invite, putting the agenda and the expectations within that so that you guys don't even have to think when you're in those meetings, you just know, here's the dashboards that we're going through, here's the expectations of each individual person, and then you're good to go. And then the last thing is changing the layout of these dashboards to be segmented by stewards of responsibility. So what this means is, you know, there, there can be within Domo all of these pages and sub pages. And what we've found to be the most used dashboards and KPIs are the ones that have been specifically created for a for one person or for one department. It is not necessarily a roll-up, it is specifically designed for these people. And then you can still have that roll-up level for the managers to distill information. But when each page is designed for a specific role, we've increased that usage. And finally, we have made it to the last step. So really, all of this has been a lot of information on what you can do outside of Domo to really make sure that A, you're building KPIs that are actually actionable um, and that you have the strategy around this, that you have the accountability around it. But really, you can also leverage Domo for a lot of this stuff. So that's what we wanted to go through at the very end here is how do you leverage Domo features for clarity, for automaticity, in these actionable KPIs. So 
Number one is to clearly define predicted action steps for your team in card level descriptions, note cards, and attaching SOPs or training documents linked into the dashboards. That can be in the form of PDFs, videos, or Word documents that you just upload into Domo. Then you can also go in and set up dynamic alerts and alert actions. There's Within Domo, they already have created this automaticity with tasks and with webhooks to allow you to take these actions and minimize the amount of human effort needed. And so you can go in and create this. One thing that we highly, highly recommend is that on each and every KPI, you're creating thresholds for accountability um, and notifications around those thresholds. So for example, let's say that a team member is responsible for uh, marketing and that they are responsible for making sure that 90% of the marketing campaigns that they are doing yield at least a you know, 1.5 return on ad spend. So what we would do is we would set up that alert for that person to say, hey, your responsibility is 90% here. So if you start to drop below, let's say 95%, we're going to notify you so that you can go and make the adjustments. You can go cut campaigns that aren't performing, right? And that person gets notified at that threshold so that they can make adjustments. And then the manager, let's say that the manager gets notified at the 90%. So if that person ever drops below 90%, the manager instantly gets notified so that they can trigger a conversation. Instead of waiting another week for, the, the, for their one-on-one, -on -one, the manager can start to reach out. But then let's say that there is a CMO or a VP that also needs to, you know, be be notified if there's anything that goes majorly askew. And so you can set these thresholds to be, you know, 95 for the team member, 90 for their manager. And then let's say it's, you know, if it drops below 75%, the CMO or the owner needs to be notified because this is a huge red flag. And if it's, if it's slipped through the cracks on these two or three levels, we need to make sure that somebody else is getting looped into the conversation so that action can take place, right? And those thresholds just create checks and balances. There shouldn't be those huge swings if it's being monitored at this level with these alerts at the at the at the lower level tiers. Um, another way that you can do this is creating or leveraging PDP personalized data permissions within Domo to create custom permissions and custom row level alerts um, that are segmented by the department. Now, again, this session is not the technical route. Um, Domo already has a bunch of uh, documentation and trainings on these things. And if you need help, you can always reach out to us. Um, but these are some of the tools that you can leverage within Domo. And then adding in that contextual knowledge and your expectations of the team members into the dashboard. Predictions and hypotheses need to be documented and any additional context for reference also needs to be linked. And then creating drill paths and drills in place are extremely important rather than having somebody go, you know, have answers to their first questions but then not being able to have access to their secondary and tertiary questions at the click of a button. So those drill paths need to be set up. And also on that note, setting up even the section level filters is really, really helpful instead of the page level filters. So that when you have this contextual uh, KPIs all together, you can have those filtered very easily. And then lastly, it's just defining those thresholds, the targets that can be even defined on a KPI level where you have that goal line actually mapped out on the chart so that people can see when they are getting closer or further away from their goals and really just clearly articulating all of the expectations for reference. So what we learned today was really those conceptual principles around how to create and how to really think about action-based uh, KPIs and dashboards and how they're not really usable until they take action. Then we went through some practical operating tools and techniques to leverage before you go and build any new dashboards. And those same techniques can be leveraged with existing dashboards, you just tweak the order of operations a little bit. So we are so excited for you guys to go and create actionable KPIs. We're so grateful to have had time with you today. And as always, if you have any questions, reach out. Thank you so much for having us.